is Annabelle Williams, known as The Vocal Coach. Uh, and I'm really excited to welcome her to Brit Week. Hi, Annabelle. Hello, my lovely. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. We've already had about half an hour of chinwag, so... Um, we, I know, we have... we're getting on far too well. This could, <laughs> this could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Annabelle, let's, let's get down to it. Um, we were introduced through Nigel Tully of the National Youth Jazz Orchestra which we're excited yes. to be working with for the Christmas programme this year. Tell us about your involvement with uh, NYJO and, and what they're doing. Well, I mean, Nigel's very, very special to me. I owe a lot to Nigel and, and particularly to Nigel, National Youth, National Youth Jazz Orchestra. You know, for me, um, it's my training ground. It's where I started. So I actually started going to Nigel when I was 15. Wow. And my music teach my music teacher from school took me up to Nigel and I met Bill and I really I've never been so intimidated in my whole life. There's all these fantastic musicians, you know, around me. And but in those days there was there was no singer that went along every week to rehearsals like there is now. So I was basically plonked in a room with a pad of music this thick, not a single song of which I'd heard of. And luckily I'd been learning sight reading because I could play a bit of piano so I could sight read a bit and I had to just kind of figure my way through these songs. And Bill said, right, go learn some songs and then come back when you've learnt one and sing it with the band. <laughs> I wow. was 15. Wow. I was plumped in the middle of the, they rehearsed in a square. I don't know if they still do, they rehearsed in a square in those, in those days. So you're literally like any, any fear, just you have to just go yeah, for it. it. Otherwise, yeah. And I would stand in the middle and I had to sing, you know, one of these songs. And I sort of went every, and I, I went every Saturday and I, abs as, as much as loving it, I feared it as well every single week because it was so scary. But I really, really loved it because I got to sing with this big band. Oh, wow. And eventually when I was 17, I got the chair. I took over um, as the singer and I held that chair till I was 23. So I really feel like through all my college training and my l private lessons, nothing prepared me for for my career in music like Nigel did so um I haven't got enough good things to say about it and I'll always have time for Nigel and Bill and Nigel and I'm just so thrilled at how Nigel has sort of brought it into this whole big organization that it is now um because you know the whole aim here is to is to expose um is to open up jazz training to young people wherever they are that's you know nice. and um, and so it's available to everybody and I just think that's wonderful because for me I, as I say I went every week and there was no singers that went and I started up um, bringing singers in going hey come and learn these songs you can sing with the big band come so, and yeah. play my toys yeah I mean seriously absolutely like, what a paint palette just, uh, just, just just to have some friends there really I mean there was no but there was no other singers I had no one to play with so yeah it was nice and then over the last 10 years it's really developed and and continued to kind of move with the times and at the moment now it's not so much like the big band thing but you break it's breaking out into different more specialized areas tell us a little bit about like the sort of development of the last 10 years well I mean I think you know when I was in the band so I <laughs> I left the band 17 years ago um, and in those days you know we were it was a great opportunity to get performing experience it was a great opportunity for you know developing your musicianship um, and, and your musicianship skills and that sort of thing and and you know we would get on the, on the Nijo bus and go up and down the country and go and play in Scunthorpe and Skegness and wonderful places like that and um, and I think now what Nigel and the team have done, I mean, they've got the offices, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole team of them now working um, on this, on Nigel, which, I, you know, they, it's, as I said before, it's more of an organization now. Um, and they spl they've split off into, I think, five different band sizes or something like that. I'm not 100% sure there, but it's four or five and, and for different levels and age groups and things like that. And, um, and so that really anybody who wants to learn jazz, go through what I went through as a 15 year old, has that opportunity. And I think there's a huge number of people that come every week now. Oh my God, how amazing. Well, yeah. I want to talk about one particular person. I mean, you've worked with so many amazing artists, Alison Moyet, Beverly Knight, Charlotte Church, Jamie Cullum, I mean, the list goes on. But one name I have to ask you about is, is Amy Winehouse. 
And I want to like sort of touch on that. How did you meet, I'm sure you've answered this question a million times, but how did you meet her <laughs> how did that all develop? Well, no, I never get bored of this story because it's just such a wonderful story and I feel so honored that, you know, I went through it. Um, so it was obviously through Nigel, through the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. And um, it was, as I said before, I was going along every week and I invited singer friends of mine to come along. And eventually we managed, because it was a charity, we managed to get government funding and I, I used to get paid um, to sort of run a workshop for these singers that came along. And, um, you know, we were getting sort of six, seven, eight singers coming along every week. And I would basically, in that little room where I was on my own, all the, you know, all those years before when I'd first joined, um, I would teach them the songs because a lot of the Nigel material is originals. Um, and so I would teach them the songs. I mean, we're talking the hardest music I've ever sung in my life still yeah. to this day. Yeah. You know, it's really, really, it was a real roast. And you know, you'd have written scat sollies with sax sections and improvised sections and huge range, you need a huge range and all that sort of thing. But as I say, it was the best training ground I could have had. And at this point, I'm now 19, leading the workshop each week and learning myself every week. And this is really, for me also, how I became a vocal coach. This is how I got into it. So it's a really interesting part of the journey for me because it's how it all began. And one week, this um, this little curly-haired Jewish girl turned up and... Uh, you know, in those days we were all smoking indoors and we were sat backstage in the um, in the dressing room smoking away and I was leading the class. <laughs> <laughs> the vocal class. <laughs> so this would be about the year 99, 2000, something like that, chuffing away and uh, talking about all our favourite singers, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, Dinah Washington, and something that Amy and I had in common is that we both love Dinah Washington, you know. So we would sit there and we would listen to like Mad About the Boy and that sort of thing and, you know, listen and discuss, which is what you do in music colleges anyway. You kind of listen to music and you break it down and you analyse it and you discuss it. And then I teach them all the songs and a lot of the time, to be completely honest with you, Amy wasn't very verbal in these lessons when it came to me teaching the song. So I wasn't sure if she necessarily was grasping what I was saying. So I'd check sometimes and go, everything okay? Because if someone sat there with not much expression on their okay. face, okay. From, a, from a sort of coaching point of view, you want to A, check that they understand what you mean. It's nothing worse than when you're coaching somebody and they don't understand the, um, the, the message you're trying to get across. So... Amy, you okay? Everything understood? Yeah, yeah, fine. It's all very laid back, very sweet, very quiet. Um, but then she would, when the time came for us to go into the main theatre and rehearse with the band and get the chance to sing the song that we've been working on for the past hour, hour and a half, um, she would just go in and absolutely smash it. And she was only 16, by the way, at this stage. So I was 19 and she was 16. So she absolutely smashed it. And we were, everyone was like, <laughs> who is this? I was like, I don't know. Just some some chick I'm talking about, Dinah Washington, backstage, who's cool while we're having our ciggies. So she was absolutely just incredible. But of course, none of us knew what the future was going to bring with Amy. And um, we we used to do these gigs on a Sunday lunchtime um, at a pub called Rainers in Rainers Lane, and it was a really kind of run down old pub and it had a function room in the back and the carpet stank and your feet stuck to the floor at the bar and that sort of thing but we used to get it was our chance each week that we got to perform and the big band would everyone would come and we'd get paid a tenner and we'd spend it all on beer and we'd get to basically rehearse in front of an old audience and it was just wonderful looking back as I say like we had this opportunity every week and one week I couldn't um, do the Sunday the Sunday lunchtime gig and Amy stepped in and, and did it for me. And Amy actually talks about this moment as sort of her first gig and where she came from. Wow. So it's really lovely that I sort of have that connection. We had that connection with her, you know, and, and we, we weren't in touch towards the later years, but I always knew who she was. She obviously always knew who I was. We bumped into each other at Ronnie's and jazz after stuff and all that sort of thing. And, and um, I always remember her mum, really sweet, sweet woman. She was always so proud of her and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, it was it was a real honour to be part of the beginning of her journey. And as I say, I've read interviews since where she says, well, I started in this, you know, back of an old pub in Rainers with this big band. And it's like, yeah, I remember that's what that was. Yeah. And she did it a couple of times. So I remember watching her one of the weeks as well. And she came and we both sang. So uh, really, really lovely memories. 
And, you know, when you look back at her voice now with your kind of much more, I mean, now you're a vocal coach, you're studying voice, you're studying the science of voice, the body, the breathing, and all the techniques and everything. If you look at her and that unique voice that she had, do you, like, what was it? What was it that she had? Was it just persona? Attitude. I mean, for me, for me, yeah, it was it was tone and delivery, because the, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what she sung. For me, it wasn't about the the song choices she made. And to be honest with you, these days, what I t with, with my coaching, it's all about song choice, a lot of the time, you know. And I don't feel that way with Amy. I actually feel the opposite way with Amy, in that she could have sung the phone book and it would have been fantastic. Right. So, right. She, whatever she sang. A, it was instantly recognisable, you know, and that's, Quincy Jones always says, that's the sign of a star, when you, when you just recognise the voice on the radio straight away and you don't need to ask who it is. Her tone was instantly recognisable and she had this delivery that she just was so confident, never questioned herself, it was just the way it was, this is me, take me or leave me, and not in an arrogant way, in any, in any stretch of the imagination, it was just, she just had it. You know, and even though and this is this is no link because I work on the X Factor, X Factor, but you know that term, the X Factor before that show, that's what I would have said she had because she did. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's so true. and she was really keen to develop her musicianship, and she was always learning and researching and singing, and yeah, she just had it. I mean, it's amazing when you see her singing with Tony Bennett. How much, you know, she has so much. She's in so much awe of Tony Bennett. You know, she. Obviously, yeah. that, I mean, that's one of the most beautiful, um, beautiful things I've ever seen. But she, I mean, yeah. every single performance, effortless. And, and so there's um, NYJO's upcoming Amy Winehouse project and current singer Lucianne Daniels. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, what are your hopes? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know Lucianne Daniels. I haven't met her, but I've seen her singing and I think she's just wonderful. And what's really nice for me is that, you know, as the Nigel, as she's the current Nigel singer, yeah. she's, um, I know exactly what she's going through because I, I went through it myself and she's just wonderful. I mean, I, I saw a video of her singing Feeling Good and oh, yeah. it's, it's, if I had to be so bold, I would say it, it is a similar vein to Amy in that everything that came out of her mouth was very natural. Um, you know, there's not many notes I would give her, <laughs> you know? So, um, and, and I just, and I like the way she sung it. I like the way she sort of mixed jazz with a bit of neo soul. She made it modern, but also had, she didn't lose any, any of those older elements of that style of music. So, which is hard to do. And she's young, I don't know how old she is, but she's young and that's hard to do, which, which means it's natural. You yeah. know, and she's whatever she's doing, she should carry on doing it because she's only great to me, and I and I think she's got a great career ahead of her. Fantastic. And then, uh, I mean, as a now vocal coach, if you had any v advice for someone pursuing a career in singing, what would it be? Because it's now it's so you know with the with all of the great talent that's coming through these shows like X Factor and Britain's Got Talent, it seems to me there's been an explosion of talent that we may not have known about before uh and you can be you know you can be sort of quite shy and retiring and then get pushed on stage and then suddenly overnight mm. you're this you know huge success definitely much more competitive what, what sort of advice would you give to someone well i mean what i personally liked about these shows is that before these the shows like x factor and britain's got talent were around i think being a star just felt so unobtainable and so far away from anything you could achieve. And we put these people up on pedestals and that sort of thing. And you had to be a certain shape. You had to be a certain size. You had to look a certain way, your hair, your makeup, or what you wore. And I definitely felt intimidated by all those things as a young singer. Um, you know, when I was in Niger, I, of course, had insecurities about not being good enough, not looking the right certain way. And I think that with these shows, I mean, goodness, look at all the different stars that have come out of these shows and look at the look at the personalities of them, look at the sizes of them, look at the way they're dressed. They're all different. And that's something I'm really keen on when I teach is that the best thing about you is you and that's what makes you so unique and wonderful don't ever compare yourself to anybody else because that's where you go wrong mm. and so actually it's spun it on its head for me and it's made everybody go 
well, if they can do it, I can do it. And it, and it gives people the confidence to audition for shows like that. And, you know, these shows aren't the only way in, but it's great for people and audiences to see, for normal people to see that anybody can apply for these shows. Anybody can do anything they put their mind to. And as a result, we've got a much more eclectic mix of um, singers, bands, artists, stars these days, uh, and something for everyone. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, obviously, you've got an amazing voice. I, I, I did, did Thank my research. You. I've watched you sing. <laughs> I can't wait to see you live. Um, and of course, Thank you co-host uh, uh, Ronnie Scott's The Blues Experience, and you perform with Nigel and and the band, and you coached all these amazing talents on these amazing shows. When you now go on stage, being this kind of you know <laughs> coach. And, and being sort of, you know, like in, in the spotlight in terms of like, well, she's obviously got to be the best voice. Do you ever get nervous? <laughs> you can't make a mistake or there's a level of ex- I. It's a good question, actually, isn't it? Because I, I quite often find myself with a room full of singers in my audience. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, which is just lovely. No, I don't I don't feel I don't feel under pressure. I don't feel. I think, you know, I'm really hot on you have to practice what you preach. So all my students know that I'm a singer and I'm a jobbing working singer and that I um, I think I have to be in order to earn their respect. Because if your coach doesn't do or has not done what it is they're coaching you, then how can you have respect for them? It's like I have to demonstrate what I'm trying to teach them. And, and most of what I've been through... Uh, most of the problems that my singers go through, I can I can help them because I've been through it myself as a singer and I draw upon my own experiences. So I generally just feel when I'm in those situations, when I'm gigging myself, I feel a lot of love in the room. I don't feel any competition because I've, I've studied hard, hard at my craft. You know, I've been having lessons for 28, 29 years, you know, and, I've, I've, I, and I'll carry on learning. Um, I started lessons, you know, so young and, and, and I'll never say that I know it all because I don't. I still have lessons now and um, I'm always learning. And if a student asks me something that I don't know the answer to, I'll be honest and tell them and I'll find out the answer. I think it's important to do so because I'm human, yeah. you know, and I'm like everybody else. And, and so I think you can't have, I, I think because I don't um, treat myself like I know it all, I, then, therefore I don't have that pressure on me. Yeah. To yeah. kind of impress i am who i am i do what i do i sing the songs that i sing and i sing the songs that suit my voice and that i love and have a great band and and that's it and then the next singer is great at what they do and then i don't compare myself to them and so on and i think it should be all about love and unity and supporting each other and it shouldn't be about comp- competitiveness or anything like that for sure i mean if you look back at the singers i know you shared a, a, with amy uh, a particular uh, love of but you know any other sort of influences on you that you would say those singers were the those voices oh yeah gosh I mean who in particular? yeah gosh I mean the, there's so many there's so many but my in terms of you my favorite singers do constantly change but the number one number one singer for me that never changes is Shaka Khan Shaka oh. Khan is just my absolute idol and and also Etta James I would say as well Etta, oh, those sort of like nasty toned kind of like the rules are there are no rules kind of singers that put absolutely everything into their performances they're not polite they're not sweet they haven't got small voice they've got big voices and that's personally for me what I love you know um and I learned so much off those singers I learned so much off Etta James I learned so much off Shaka Khan off Mm -hmm. Prince off uh, Aretha Franklin you Uh, know Brian McKnight, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, I mean, proper singers. Um, Did I say Prince? Freddie Mercury, no, you know what I mean? Singers who can really sing and really, really know how to phrase like a real musician. That's what I love. Yeah, fantastic. Do you think anyone can sing? I mean, do you think it's, because I I, I remember when I was at drama school years ago, we had a a guy called Chuck Mallett. Uh, It was our vocal. It's a good name. It's a bit like a porn star's name, I must say, but (laughs) <laughs> he was a wonderful, wonderful man. He actually taught Laurence Olivier how to sing at the National. That was his big, you know, that was his big... Oh, my gosh. Anyway, he used to come into class and he used to say, you know, anyone can sing. It's all about telling a story. And and so we had a few people that were like, oh, I've got Ness and Dorma then. And you kind of think, well... <laughs> absolutely, you know, terrible. So it's an interesting question. Like, do you think anyone... It can- is, yeah. 
Well, I mean, as for that vocal coach, you know, it's your job to be encouraging. So at least he was ticking that box. Um, for me, uh, I always say, if, if you can talk, you can sing. Um, because, you know, if your vocal cords work and you can make a sound, then yes, you can sing. Mm. Um, whether that sound is pleasing to the to somebody else is all subjective. So I actually don't think necessarily, I mean, it's a very general thing to say, but yeah, I generally think, you know, if I teach, if I'm working with somebody that was really, really a beginner and it had a long, long way to go. After a year, a year of training with me, yes, you're going to get to a certain point where, you know, you're a lot better. Are you going to get to that point where you're as good as a certain singer that you look up to or whatever? No, not necessarily. Or, or sometimes, you know, sometimes I see singers that don't have as much natural talent as people with natural talent, but these guys don't work as hard. And then they do and they can end up taking over. I've seen that as well. So, but I definitely think it's all subjective and it's not up to, you know, it's up to you who you like. It's up to me who I like. And if I don't like a thing that you like, that's okay and vice versa. So, but I would definitely, and I think it's down to song. It's down to, um, you know, performance. And, and it is down to being able to tell a story and connecting to a lyric. And, you know, you can have a one octave voice and, you know, you can have a tiny range. Um, Billy Holiday didn't have a very big range, you know, mm -hmm. but if you can tell a story and connect and have pain in your voice and fragility, then you can be, you know, a better singer than the one with the four, four octave range. Yeah, you think of so, Leonard Cohen or Nina Simone. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it really isn't about range or agility or even even as a, from a vocal coach point of view, even technique. It is not about being technically perfect. You know, the the imperfect vocal is often the perfect vocal. Yes. The one where the voice the one the one where the voice breaks because they're feeling the pain so much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so that's, you know, it has to move me. It has to, I have to feel what you're seeing and, and you have to be real in order to do that. You know, you have to picture the, the face of the person that you're singing to and, and have a connection to that song because if you don't have a connection to it, your audience won't have a connection to you. So that's really, you know, can differentiate between, you know, somebody who can sing and somebody who can't sing. And they may not have the best voice in the world, but be able to do that. And that's the real talent. You better be careful here because we'll be charging for a masterclass soon. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that one. You can have that one for free. <laughs> and um, if you were to look at what your favourite song was, is there is there one particular song that really is the, you know, I'll pull this one out. This is the well, one. Well, there is, but all my singer friends get so sick of me because I, it's all I ever sing. So uh, if I go to Rodney's and we've had a few drinks and I get up and sing and they go, oh, not that one again. But I always sing um, I'd Rather Go Blind by Etta James. But I just love it. It's my song. It's, you know, I can show off on it. It's, everyone has that song they know they sing really well and that's mine. So I never get sick of it. And even to the point where I actually banned myself from doing it on my gigs and I didn't do it for about two years because everyone was so sick of me singing it. But I never got sick of it. So um, it, it's back in the repertoire now because I've given everyone a break. Well, we're going to try and find <laughs> play that one uh, um, it'll, it'll be all over youtube it's yeah, all i ever do we'll, we'll put it in. um as a live performer right now i mean it's a nightmare isn't it you, you know all of the all of yeah. the stuff, and stuff how are you getting by i mean are you practicing at home and doing as much as you can to keep sharp and i mean i'm incredibly lucky i i have been super busy during this time i think it started off um as when when lockdown first happened a lot of people who were forced to stay at home went you know what i've got some time off i'm gonna have those singing lessons i promised myself that i've always been meaning to do and um and so got in touch so i actually got a lot of new clients in the beginning which is obviously great for me um and then throughout that throughout that time i've had britain's got talent um i've been working and I've, but i've done it all from sat here remotely wow. uh, and all my private clients as well um, and people have been coming for lessons and just little little kind of just to get me to check their voice over and things because singers aren't singing and you know people kind of want me to set them up with daily programs or little online things they can do and that, just to keep it all ticking over um and now i'm i'm working on this new tv show this, this new bbc tv show um which is out in january so that's kept me really busy so i personally am i mean i know i'm incredibly lucky and i'm in the minority and that's why i say yes to everything because you just don't know when it's going to run out um but you know, all my friends, my husband's a trumpet player, all my musician friends, 
I mean, it's just devastating. And, and the fact that we've, we're kind of going through it all again and everyone just thought it was going to get better and it's just getting worse is, I don't know what to say really. I mean, it, it, it's really, really bad. It's really bad. And um, I don't, you know, I just want to see the light at the end of the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel for them, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it is amazing that we can use this technology and that you can coach over, over the, you know, Zoom. So lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Yeah, I'm so, so lucky that I've got, I've got the opportunity to still be able to coach people um, because a lot of my friends in the industry, you know, I've got some makeup artist friends, for example, that just cannot work yeah. and haven't worked since March. So I'm so, so grateful that I can still do it. And it was nice to, you know, the beginning of Britain's Got Talent, for example. Okay, you've got 21 singers and, uh, you know, six weeks to get them ready. Can you do it online? And I had to make a decision. I didn't know. I hadn't. I hadn't done a series online before, so I had to kind of accept the challenge. And it's a lot, you know, and, 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 and everyone will, will agree with this, that sitting in front of the, 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 the iPad or the screen or whatever it is, for hours and hours and hours is a lot, it's a lot. You know, yeah. it affects your mental health, your eyesight. Yeah. It's really tiring, so, so it's, it's important. breaks and go out for a walk and- you Yeah, know, military. absolutely. Yeah. So you yeah. mentioned the, the TV series. You've got three TV series on the go, haven't you? Well, I did have up until about two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so Britain's got, Britain's got Talent finished, yeah. And there was Britain's Got Talent Christmas, which didn't happen in the end. Uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll do that again. Um, and then um, I'm now doing a series. I've not actually announced this, so maybe I can give you a little exclusive. Um, I'm working on a brand new TV show called I Can See Your Voice. Um, which is on in January, and that's all I can say. But um, tune in in January. It's going to be very, very good. I'm very excited about it. It's the first time that it's happened over in this country, um, but it's just started in America, so they're on their third episode, I think. So it's a really, really fun concept, and I'm having a lot of fun uh, as head vocal coach on that one. So, yeah, loving it. Um, and so apart from the TV shows and stuff, what, what else is there planned? Well, I'm really excited about, uh, in June, I brought out my app, my vocal, the Vocal Coach app, oh, wow. which I've been, yeah, I've been talking about doing it for about four or five years. And in lockdown, I sort of used the extra time that I had and finally got it out after months and months of testing. So it's a vocal, it's a warm up app for singers for all different levels. It's got lots of really fun um, exercises that aren't just to piano backing tracks, they're to fully produce kind of Bruno Mars-esque, Justin Timberlake-esque kind of backing tracks. And they've got me chatting all the way through and just telling you what to do. And each exercise has a little video attached of me explaining what to do. And you can make your own playlist of exercises. And it's designed for all singers of all levels and ages to do, you know, for, with, if you're a beginner, you wanted to just, you're just starting out and thinking, you know, I want to go for singing lessons, but I can't afford it, or I don't have time, or I'm too scared buy the app it's available on google and apple um, oh. and also for singers if you're in the dressing room uh, and need something to warm up to just stick it on you don't have to think about it what a brilliant idea absolutely thank Can't you wait. oh i'm gonna be thank you that. so much yeah yeah so it's called the vocal coach so go um, buy it please <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i'm sure everyone will even if they're yeah. a pop singer they'll be on it absolutely yeah good luck with everything and yeah, let's just keep... Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And um, best of luck with Brit Week. I think it's a fantastic, a fantastic thing and I'm really excited to be a part of it. So thank you for having me. Excellent. Well, Annabelle, good luck and we'll speak soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. 